Hey there. Thanks for tuning in. You ready for another episode of my Bigfoot sighting? All right then. Let's do this. Seen a bunch of rundown new horse towns where the church is the backbone, loves in the bow. And the five string melodies grooving. With the farmland rows where the roots run deep. Beyond the noise of the busy streets. Where the songs of the south are soothing. When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out. I don't run from banjo music. Yeah. My Bigfoot sightings totally changed my perspective on what I thought was possible in this life. It was 2005. I was visiting my mom and my stepdad in Lonedale, Missouri. My four-year-old son and I would go and we would spend four days to a week at a time usually there. We would make a couple hour drive down. And it was on about 350 acres or so of land that they lived on. My stepdad, Jeff, worked as a farmhand for the landowner who also lived on the land. And my son and I would play outside most days. And there were a couple ponds, one out back to the right side of the trailer that my parents lived in. And one down across the field from us, there was a lot of woods. There were croplands around. But, you know, it wasn't too far out of, out of town. So we would play outside. We would draw on the, on the driveway with sidewalk chalk. We blew bubbles. You know, we'd kick a ball around. And just have a good time. Um, the landowners had a dog. His name was Buddy. I think he was just a mixed breed. He was a smaller dog, maybe about the size of a small terrier. He was a really good dog, and very kind and sweet. And he liked to hang out with us and run around with us. So we were just sitting on the front porch one day. It was actually a deck built onto the front of the trailer. And to our right at the front of the driveway was a large garage. It was kind of like a shop building. And then across the driveway was a large field and a pond. And we're sitting there, my son and I, and I just, I noticed movement out in this field quite a ways off, but noticeable. And instinctually, I, I, I really don't understand why. I just knew to get my son and get inside. And it happened so quickly. I don't think I even said anything. I just grabbed him and went in the trailer and shut and locked the door behind us. And then I went over to the windows and it was watching this thing walking through the field directly toward the trailer. And my son was watching with me. And I, I just, I kept staring at it like, what is that? And that's exactly what I kept repeating, not purposefully, but it's just, that's just what kept coming out of my mouth is, what is that? And my son, Every time he would answer me, I don't know, mom. I don't know. And I would again, what is that? And it was slowly walking again in a direct path toward the trailer. And it got into the front yard on the other side of the driveway. And at the time, there was a wooden decorative fence that was near that far side of the driveway. And um, this thing, because I didn't know what it was at the time, walked up to the fence 
And the fence ran parallel to the trailer. So as he was walking by this fence, I was getting the side view of him. His left side was to the fence and his right side was to the trailer. And he was looking down at the ground and, and kind of scanning left to right on the ground, right next to the fence. And I was thinking, you know, he's searching for something. He's looking for something. And he was walking very slow and, and just panning back and forth like that on the ground. So we're, my son and I are watching this and I just, I'm, my brain felt like it was flipping through a Rolodex, like trying to match what I was seeing to every known living being or animal that I had been taught about. And nothing was matching. At this point, what astounded me the most, one, was that it was walking on two legs. And two, that it was the most brilliant, beautiful, long, white hair I had ever seen. It was perfectly clean and it was almost just, I've heard in the years that have followed that Sasquatch hair may be transparent in a way. It may be clear. And when I think back to how brilliantly this white hair seemed to shine, that makes some sense to me because it just, seemed just to not glow, but I mean, it was just brilliant and long and straight and smooth and well-kept. And I remember that was something that I'll absolutely never forget. I've, I've never seen an animal with hair like that. And um, so we're watching him walk along the fence looking down at the ground. And I just remember thinking, I've got to get an unobstructed view of this thing. I don't want to be looking through a window and a screen. I want to see it without anything between he and I. And so I gathered up some courage because I could tell that if he followed the same path he was on, he was going to walk on the other side of the garage from me and I'd not be able to see him anymore. And I wanted to see him un unobstructed before that happened. So I walked to the front door and I slowly opened the door and grabbed the screen door handle. And I slowly opened the handle just enough where I could peek my head through. And as I opened the screen door, it squeaked. So by the time I got my head turned to look at this thing, he was looking back at me. And our eyes met. And it took my breath away. And I just stood there, frozen. And I will never forget meeting his gaze. And I was instantly flooded with this feeling of he's so sad that I'm so scared. He's so disappointed that I'm so afraid. I almost got a feeling of loneliness. I wasn't afraid of him because of anything that he was doing. He wasn't being aggressive in any way. He didn't make a mean face. He didn't growl. He didn't make any noise at all. In fact, I didn't even hear him walking. And it was just grass, but I, I couldn't even hear 
a single step. And um, so we are looking at each other in the eyes. I'm frozen, not sure what to do. And he turns his gaze, he turns his body back the direction that he was facing and just continues to walk. And um, he gets on the other side of the garage and out of our line of sight. And so I shut the door and my son and I take off running down the end of the trailer to the end of the trailer to the bedroom that my mom was sleeping in. And this all happened about three o'clock in the afternoon. It was broad daylight, very easy to see. The weather was beautiful that day. So we run down the trailer into her room. The head of her bed was at the windows that we needed to look out of. So my son jumped up on the bed. You know, I'm peeling back curtains and he's peeling back curtains and in our tizzy, my mom's like, what, what's going on? You know, she wakes up, what are you doing? What's going on? And, and I didn't even know what to say, you know, just, just like, where is it? Just what mom, you know, like you, you got to see this. What, what is this? And so my son and I are looking out the windows, frantically searching for it, for the Sasquatch. And we didn't see him. So apparently he didn't continue the same path and walk to the end of the garage and passed it toward the pond. But we watched and when it felt like it had been too long and he should have come out on the other side, we go back into the living room. And we look out those windows. We didn't see him anywhere there either. And my mom's awake at this point and she's asking us, you know, what did you see? And I said, I don't know what it was, but it was tall and it was walking on two legs and it had really long, bright white hair from head to toe covering it. And it was walking. Mom, what, what is that? And she's, I don't, I don't know what it was. Was it a bear? No, mom, this wasn't a bear. I mean, it had big black eyes and it had a face like, like ours. It didn't have like a bear face. And she, well, the neighbors have white dogs. Was it a dog? No, mom, it didn't, didn't even have a dog face. It wasn't on four legs. It was walking and it was tall. And, and my son said it had hands and it had feet. And she's like, well, I don't know. And I'm like, well, this is kind of a big deal. There's something huge walking around the front yard. What, what is it? Do I need to be afraid? Can we go back out there? Is, is my son safe to go out there? And I should mention that Buddy, the dog, had been out there sitting on the porch with us when I saw that thing when I saw that movement and my instinct kicked in and I grabbed my son and I ran inside. So poor buddy was left out on the porch by himself. And he had been sleeping in one of the porch chairs. So while this whole encounter is going on and my son and I are watching from the windows, poor buddy, he woke up at some point, probably while we were running inside and jumped down from the chair and got underneath the chair. And I couldn't really see him from the windows because the chair was back up against the wall and he was under it. But I heard him and he was barking, but it was a very nervous, timid bark. It wasn't a bark of I'm angry or like he wasn't, I could tell it wasn't like, you know, a dominant bark. He wasn't trying to tell the Sasquatch what to do. I think it was more of like a, I see you, I know you're there and, and I don't like it and I'm kind of scared. So, you know, Hey buddy, could you leave type of bark? So I, I felt bad because 
but he was out there all by himself, but I was too afraid to open the door and go get him. And he wasn't allowed inside the trailer. So I was even concerned for Buddy's safety. And my mom just kind of, yeah, well, I don't know. Hmm. Oh, well, you know, let's go outside and sit and have a cup of coffee. And I'm like, what? Wait a minute. You know, what? Where, where did it go? It was just like, you know, like nothing, like nothing had happened. My dad, my stepdad, Jeff, got home from work that day and he was the farmhand there on that land. So I was so excited to see him and I said, hey, this is what we saw today. What is it? And he was like, I don't know. I've never seen anything like that. And I just, I couldn't wrap my mind around that. Like, how could you not have seen this? You know, just walked into the yard. Please, I, I needed answers. I needed to know what it was that we were watching. Were we safe? I had so many questions. And my mom didn't have answers and Jeff didn't have answers. And so I was married at the time and I called my husband and I asked him, I told him, I described, you know, this, it was tall and it was covered in long white hair and it had big black eyes. And I'll never forget the eyes. They were, they were, uh, I don't, they were at least golf ball size and completely black, but there was so much life in them. They were not scary looking at all. Um, they were just, I, they were deep. There was something, there was intellect in them. And so I'm describing what we saw to my husband and he didn't have any answers for me. He didn't know what it was. And so life went on. And I don't remember being afraid to go outside there the next time that we came to visit. I guess the way it was handled by everyone around me was just, you know, they didn't see it. So it didn't impact them. So there was just nothing, nothing to worry about. Life goes on. And that's what happened. So I didn't have any answers and I stopped asking questions. Years later, it was 2008. I was living in Michigan and I was playing a computer game called Zoo Tycoon. And I had leveled up to a point where I could put a Yeti in my zoo. And so I build the exhibit for the Yeti and then it's time to place the Yeti in the exhibit. And out pops the Yeti and I'm looking at it and I'm like, whoa, that is what was in my parents' front yard in Lonedale, Missouri. All I knew about Yetis was that they were in the Himalayas. And the Missouri is a long way from the Himalayas. So I, I didn't understand why I would have seen a Yeti in Missouri. So I immediately got on the internet and did a search for Yeti. And within a few results, I found information about Bigfoot. And I had not really been exposed to much about Bigfoot in my life. I remember as a kid, the movie Harry and the Hendersons came out, but I, I didn't ever watch it. It just never sparked my interest. So I I think that the few things about Bigfoot that I had ever seen were always of a black or a brown gorilla type looking creature. And what I saw that day in Lonedale was not like that at all. Of course, it was white. It wasn't brown or black, completely white. And nothing about it reminded me of a gorilla. Even, even though it walked with uh, somewhat of, of a hunched form, its shoulders were kind of hunched. I don't know whether that was 
normal or if that was because he was looking at the ground, searching for something. So he was looking down and kind of hunched the whole time. I knew that he was big enough that he could have caused some damage, that he could have hurt us. I don't think the door would have even stopped him, the door to the trailer. If he wanted to get in, I don't think the door could have even kept him out. I've never been good at mathematical estimations. So it was difficult for me to describe how big he was. But I recently went back to that same place in Lone Dell, Missouri. And I had my boyfriend, who's less than six feet tall, stand right where the Bigfoot would have been walking. The fence was no longer there, but I stood there on that front porch and I looked at, out at my boyfriend and it hit me of how big that Sasquatch had to be because my boyfriend looked small compared to what I remember the Sasquatch being. The Sasquatch was big enough that I could see its hands. I could easily see its facial features. And then my mom told me later when we talked about it that that wooden fence was four feet high off the ground, the top of it. I know the Sasquatch was at, at least two feet higher than that. And that was with him hunched over. So we'll say he was maybe about six feet tall. What really what I couldn't get my attention off of that day watching him was that he was on two legs, walking on two legs and covered in this brilliant white hair. And then when we met eyes, so those three things are what stayed with me most. But he was definitely big. So I did the, the search. I came across Bigfoot results and I found the BFRO website. And so I went to it and I read through a few of the encounters, the sightings that it listed. And I didn't find anything about white Bigfoot. But I decided to send in my encounter and I got a phone call from a man with the BFRO and we spoke. And um, he was able to tell me that white Sasquatch do exist, that they are such a thing. And I finally had answers that I had needed for three years. So I sent in my report and they posted it. And I felt like I finally had a little bit of closure, but there was still so much that I didn't understand. Like this just opened up a whole new world to me. You know, like this, these are real. This is, you know, this is what I saw. And oh my gosh, I've got to learn about these things. And the more I learned, the, the more things made sense to me that I didn't understand before. So I had was at the trailer. This was before my sighting and it was nighttime. And my stepdad was grilling out on that front porch. And like I mentioned, the garage is there in front of the driveway. So between the end of the trailer and the garage, there's like an alleyway, if you will. And then the pond back behind that. And I'm sitting there on the porch at night and the porch light's on, but that alleyway is fairly long and it was dark. And I just remember feeling like I was being watched and it was making me uneasy, but I, I kept second guessing myself and thinking, no, there's nothing there. Nobody's watching you. You're fine. And then I thought, well, maybe with the grill, with us grilling steaks, you know, maybe there's a coyote or something. And I became uneasy. And so I got up and I went inside. Well, knowing what I know now after having learned about Sasquatch and many people who've encountered them, that feeling 
of being watched is it can be a common occurrence. So I remembered, I recalled that that had happened to me that night. Also, there was one night that it was dark, but it wasn't too late. But I was out laying on the driveway on the phone with my husband. And I remember looking up at the trees and up at the stars. And I grew uneasy. I had this weird feeling come over me. And I was like, someone is is listening to me. It wasn't even just being watched. I just felt like someone is eavesdropping. Someone's listening to me talk on the phone to my husband. And one moment I feel safe out there laying alone on the driveway in the dark watching the stars. And the next moment I'm like, get inside now. And so I, I went inside. And um, that pond there behind the trailer, there were black swans. And they, there was one in particular that was very mean. If you even acted like you were going to be within 10 feet of that pond, he was coming after you and he was not happy about seeing you, not happy you were there. And it made sense to me at the time because their nests and their babies, their eggs, even the other adult swans, they were all disappearing and no one knew why or how. But I remember hearing everybody talking about it and how upsetting it was because they were so beautiful. So I was like, well, you know, no wonder why that, that swan's so mean. There's some, you know, coyote or something coming in here and taking its babies. And so looking back on these things that were happening around the trailer during that time started to make much more sense to me the more I learned about Bigfoot. So fast forward quite a few years and my son is now a teenager. And I've become, I kind of have some years where I listen to a lot of things about Bigfoot and learn a lot and read about activities. And, and then I'll have some time go by where I'm focused on other things. And I had another baby. So I was busy, you know, raising two babies and taking care of my home and my husband. And so my son's a teenager and I said, Hey, remember that time we saw that Bigfoot in the front yard at Nana's and Papa's house? And he said, yeah, I remember. So we saw it more than once. What? So we saw it more than once. We saw it more than one time. And I said, when did, when did we see it again? I said, I remember it walking into the yard. And he said, no. He said, you were doing dishes one day. And I was in the living room playing with my Spider-Man toys. And you called my name. And I didn't want to stop playing, but you kept calling my name. You said, Clayton, come here. Clayton, come here. And so I get up and go in the kitchen. And you said, look. And you picked me up and held me up so that I could see out the kitchen window. And he said, a little ways across the yard, under a pine tree, was a white Bigfoot and he was digging in the snow and picking things up out of the snow or off the ground and putting them in his mouth. And I was like, what? Are you kidding me? And, you know, and he was completely serious and he recalled that its fingernails kind of looked like claws, that they were a dark gray color that they were kind of long, they looked dirty. He said it was bigger than the Bigfoot that we saw walking in the yard that day. And so when I think about this, if he saw the Bigfoot digging in the snow, that must have been the winter of 2005, 2006. He would have been five by then. And the encounter that I remember happened in August. So it would have been before that, it would have been the fall before the day that I saw it while doing dishes that I don't have any recollection of. And it was unsettling to me that that happened, that I saw a Bigfoot 
sitting outside while I was doing dishes. My son clearly remembers it, but I didn't. It was unsettling. It made me wonder, did other things happen that I don't remember? Was that because it scared me so bad that I forgot? Was it something that the Bigfoot could have done to cause me to forget? I was very grateful that I remembered the day that he walked into the yard. But I think also some of the reason for that might be that because nobody had answers for me and no one, none of the adults in my life treated it as if it were any big deal that this unknown creature walked into the yard one day, it just wasn't talked about. And so I guess there was nothing I could do that I knew to do when I saw them. And so I just continued to do dishes. And my son said he went back in the living room and kept playing with Spider-Man toys and life went on. So after talking to my son when he was a teenager about those encounters, I was then living in Michigan and things started to happen on that land and around that house. At this point, we lived on eight acres. We had the Shiawassee River running through that property. We had a large front yard with a great big vegetable garden and a fairly big backyard. And um, we had nature trails through the wooded part of the property that we lived on. And my kids and I would go walking through those nature trails all the time. We would drive our golf cart through them. And I would often go alone. It was very peaceful for me. I would go walk to the ridge that overlooked the river. And down by the river was nothing but mud. So I wouldn't go down there but I would sit and lean against a great big tree up on this bridge. And I would read, sometimes I would write, and it was just very peaceful. Well, one day I found footprints in the nature trails in a low area where it was quite muddy. And other things had been happening before then that had me wondering were there Sasquatch in the area? And I really had a hard time allowing myself to believe that that could be possible because even with as much as I had learned, I had not heard about people being marked or tagged. I had not learned that many people who had seen one somewhere often saw them or had experiences with them again later, even in a totally different location. I hadn't learned that yet. So I, to myself, I was thinking, okay, you know, what are the odds that I would have a Sasquatch walk into my yard in Missouri and then I'd move 14 hours away to Michigan and have Sasquatch activity there? This just can't be possible. This has got to be all in my head. There's no way. And my husband at the time, he had grown up on the land adjacent to the land we were living on and roamed those woods his entire childhood. He hunted, he trapped, had never seen a Bigfoot out there and told me, there's no way they're here. Maybe that's what you saw in Missouri. I don't know, but I do know they are not in these woods here in Michigan. They're not. And so I would go out to feed my beagle. He was a hunting dog, so he was kept outside. And I would go out to feed him and I would have to go and get his food bowl out of the tree line that was about five feet or so away from his doghouse where his food bowl was kept. And we kept his food and water bowl where he could reach it, but where his cable wouldn't knock it over. So when it was in the tree line, it was beyond his reach. And I kept wondering how and why is his food bowl getting in the trees all the time? It was just, it became a normal thing. And I mentioned it to my husband and he did not seem 
to give it a second thought. Didn't really concern him at all. And so it just became a thing. You go get the bowl out of the tree line, you fill it back up with dog food, and the next morning you go and get it out of the tree line again. And then um, in the dining room of that home, I had my computer desk. And I was going to college online at the time. So I spent a lot of time at that computer desk. And there was a great big window there in the dining room to my right. And I was sitting right next to it. And so late night hours, I would have the lights on and I would be sitting there studying and working. And I started hearing what sounded like rocks being thrown at the window one night, which didn't make any sense to me because there aren't even rocks in that area that I was aware of. There wasn't any gravel and it sounded like little pieces of gravel hitting the window. And it was often enough that I could tell it, it, it wasn't just random. It wasn't like, you know, an acorn fell and hit the window and that was it. It continuously, it kept happening while I was sitting there that night. And that was right where my beagle was outside. That's where he was. But I was up high. I was probably, the window was probably about 20 feet off the ground or so. But I, and I do remember getting this feeling like, ooh, there's something out there throwing stuff at my window. Like what in the world? And I think I got up and went to bed. And by that point in my life, I had just grown to kind of keep things to myself. I didn't feel like, my husband understood or could provide any validation. And, and if anything, he would tell me, you know, no, that's nothing throwing anything at the window and the dog bowl, not, none of it. None of it means anything. So I just started keeping everything to myself. Well, then that day that I was out in the trails and I came across the prints, that was something much more solid. And I took pictures of them and they weren't very large. They were larger than my foot, and I wear about a size six, but they were bare, human-like footprints in the mud. And if there was some human barefoot walking through my trails on our land, that was an issue. That would be a safety issue. And so I mentioned that, of course, to my husband, and he didn't like it. He was concerned, but he didn't have any answers for it. So I started to take bags of carrots. And <laughs> I don't know why bags of carrots. I must have read something or something. I would take bags of carrots and I would hang them up as high as I could get them in trees out in this property. And I would go back in a few days and I would check them and they weren't ever disturbed. But I remember the land was really awesome. There, in Michigan, there are great big pine trees, big enough where I could kind of hunch down a little bit and walk underneath of them onto these plush beds of pine needles. And my kids and I would sit out there on those pine needles and we would have picnics and we would sing songs and just have a good time. And so nothing ever took the carrots. But after seeing those prints, I was like, okay, maybe there really is something here. My daughter was outside playing one day by herself. And she came bursting through the front door, very scared, very upset, and said, mommy, 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 there are monsters chasing me. There are monsters chasing me. And... You know, I go to her and I hold her and I'm like, it's okay. You're safe. I'm here. You're here. You know, I shut and lock the door and I'm like, what do you mean? There were monsters chasing you. And she said, they were running after me. They were running after me. I could, they were chasing me. And she was crying. She was very upset. And so I helped to calm her down. And I don't remember what we did after that, but it, I probably just distracted her and played for a little while and helped to soothe her and calm her down. She was either four or five at the time. And um, I didn't really think anything of it. I, I didn't connect dots 
at the time while I was living there, I, I never would have, I didn't think at the time that to a young child, a Sasquatch, if that might have been what it was, would very much look like a monster. And, and maybe that's what a child would call a Sasquatch if they saw one. That didn't even cross my mind. And I regret that now because I should have done more to go out and investigate and to also make sure that my kids were safe when they went outside and played. I assumed that because they were right outside the house and they were right there, that they were safe, that our dog was with them. I had a pit bull as well, and he would go outside and play and be with them while they were out there playing. And I just assumed that they were safe because they were that close. And I thank God that they were never hurt. But I do know now that that possibility exists. There was another thing that happened while living in that house in Michigan. I'm not sure. I think my daughter was about five at the time. And she came running down the hallway from the kitchen, dining, living area to my bedroom. And she said, Mom, I just saw a giant wolf tail in the kitchen. Go through the kitchen door. And I didn't, you know, the... I think pretty typical thing, which is you saw what, you know, what? And she said, there's a giant wolf tail in the kitchen. It was going through the the door. And I said, well, show me. And so we walked down the hallway. Our kitchen had two doorways, one that went in from the living room and one that went out into the dining room. And off the other dining room wall, the opposite wall of the kitchen doorway was a deck and sliding glass doors. And I would often have the sliding glass door open because if the weather was nice and I would just shut the screen door because the sliding glass door was very hard to open and close. At one point, it didn't have a handle. (laughs) And I've always been one to love having windows open and the breeze coming through. I don't recall if that day, if the screen door was open or if the glass door was closed, but I, I really didn't think that it could be a reality that a giant wolf could be in my kitchen. It didn't, it just didn't seem like that could be a reality. And yet my daughter had never hallucinated that I had ever been aware of. She did not tell stories about seeing things when she wasn't seeing something. She wasn't one to to do that. And so I don't know why I didn't investigate further. I remember looking in the kitchen and clearly not seeing anything that wasn't supposed to be there. I don't remember seeing anything anywhere in the house. I didn't see that there was anything to be concerned about. And yet, very clearly now, I do. And that's difficult for me to understand about myself because I had already seen the Sasquatch in Missouri. And though I was having a hard time wrapping my head around the fact that they could possibly be in Michigan and least of all on the land that I was on, again, what are the odds? A giant wolf, I had never even heard of such a thing. So I was speaking with my daughter recently, who is a teenager now, and we were talking about the Sasquatch encounter that her brother and I had before she was born. And I told her, you know, I think they were around that house that we lived in when you were growing up. And she said, yeah, I saw a lot of weird things at that house. I said, what did you see? What, you know, what happened? And she said, well, I don't know what it was, but there were these big wolves walking outside of our windows, walking in the yard. And she said, I just remember looking out the windows and seeing big wolves walking around. And to her, 
it was just a common thing. She didn't know that there weren't supposed to be big wolves walking around the yard. But I'm glad she knew that it, for them to be in the kitchen wasn't normal. But even when she told me, I didn't really do anything. I, I couldn't give her any answers. So it makes sense that she, from what I recall, I don't remember her mentioning that to me when she was younger and when she was actually seeing the wolves walking around outside. But she does remember them walking. So I live in Missouri again now. And I actually live a little over an hour, possibly closer to two hours from Lone Dell, Missouri, where my Sasquatch encounter took place. And I've been living here since about July. I live on about 40 acres. And I decided one day to walk out to this big tree out in the corner of the front yard by the tree line. It's ways away from the front door, but I can see it. And being that I know Sasquatch exists and that they can be anywhere, I've learned that, I decided to walk out there one day and introduce myself in case there were any around, tell them my name and let them know I'm a friend and that I don't mean them any harm. And to also ask them, please don't scare me. So I, that's what I did. I walked out there one day and I left the dogs inside and I told them those things and I just made conversation for about 30 minutes. And when I was done, I thought, well, I'm going to take a few pictures. And I hadn't seen or heard anything, but I just thought, I'll just take a few pictures of the, the woods, see if. I see anything later when I look at them. And so I reach from my back pocket to grab my phone. And I hear this really loud crack from behind me. And I had been standing in between the tree line and this great big tree. And so when that crack happened, I jumped and I turned and I started, I took like five fast steps towards the house. And then I realized that's not what I wanted to do. I didn't want to be afraid because I'm, if I could go back to my original encounter, I could go back to that day, knowing what I know now, I might have still gotten up and gotten my son and gone inside, but I would not have been as afraid. I wouldn't have had to wonder what I was seeing. I would have had the name. I would have had the answer for the Sasquatch that was in my yard. So I feel I would have been much better prepared and much less traumatized, much less afraid. And maybe I even would have said hello. I don't know. So that day that I was out there talking by the tree and I heard that loud crack and I started taking off towards the house, I said, no, you're not going to be afraid this time. You're not running this time. You're okay. You're all right. Just take a breath, turn back around. And so that's what I did. And I turned around and I apologized. I said, I'm sorry. I'm really trying not to be afraid. I'm just nervous. But I, I, I'm here. I'm here. And stood there for a little bit longer. I think I might have said a few more things. And then I was like, okay, I'm done. Nothing else is happening. And take a few pictures. So I go to reach for my phone again. And again, another loud crack. And the best way I can describe it is if there's a, a fairly big tree limb on the ground that someone is kind of dead and someone steps on it really hard and breaks it. That's what it sounded like. And so I was looking at the ground around this tree, trying to see what, what's making that noise. How, how did that happen? I didn't even think to look up in the tree. And this was probably mid August, late August or so when I did that. So the tree was full of leaves and the tree line was impossible to see far into. And, but when that second crack happened, when I was reaching for my phone again, I was like, okay, nope, I'm out. And I 
went inside and I shut and locked the door. And I was like, wow, you know, that, I don't know, you know, was that something or not? But it definitely made me nervous. So I'm not sure how much time passed, not a whole lot of time, maybe a few days, possibly a week or so. I was going to the restroom and my boyfriend and I live in a shop building is basically what it is. I like it. It's pretty cool. Actually, it's got a kitchen and a bathroom and two bedrooms and a living room and front door and windows and walls and closets. It's got all of that, but it's a shop building. So the walls on the outside are tin. And they're not very thick walls. (laughs) So I'm using the restroom. And right behind me on the wall, behind the toilet, I hear this incredibly loud bang. And I almost thought the wall was coming down on me. I, I really couldn't jump. But I kind of, you know, flinched and hunched and was like, wow, what is, you know, it scared me. But I just sat there (laughs) and had no idea what it was. But right after the big bang on the wall, it sounded like thunder rolled toward the tree line. And it had not been storming that day. I had not heard thunder at all before that. And I didn't hear thunder for the rest of the day after that. It didn't storm. It didn't even rain. I didn't see any lightning. So I had no idea what that was. I technically still don't know what that was, but it caught my attention. And with what I've learned, I do know that Sasquatches will bang on homes. And I've since learned that sometimes it's the juvenile Sasquatches that do that. So it possibly could have been that. And I'm getting better about not discounting things that happen, not ignoring them. And I'm still working on not letting them cause me to be afraid, but also not invalidating their occurrence. And I've also learned about how it can be common for people who've seen one Sasquatch, even if it's in Missouri, to go to Michigan and have it happen there and then come back to Missouri and have it happen again in a different location. I know that's not impossible. So I had that loud bang happen and that what sounded like thunder going back towards the tree line. And when my boyfriend got home, I asked him about it and he said, maybe it was a sonic boom. And I don't know that I've ever heard a sonic boom before, so I don't know what they would sound like, but I have a hard time understanding how that would cause for an impact on a wall directly on the wall. It didn't sound like a distant thing. I mean, it, but when I checked the wall outside, there was no damage. It didn't even look like the grass around the building had been smashed. It didn't look like anything had been disturbed. And I asked my boyfriend, I said, could something have been on the roof? And he said, if there was anything on the roof, it would cave in. The roof would cave in. Anything of any significant amount of weight would cause the roof to cave in. So that's lovely. (laughs) So I hope that doesn't happen. So it was September 11th, and my boyfriend had mentioned an old cemetery on some land that adjoins the land that we live on. And I've always had an appreciation for older cemeteries and the history, and I feel like maybe it's kind in a way to go and to read the headstones of those people that lived their lives and were here and to just read their names and remember them. And so we went there on September 11th. There were some soldiers that were buried there. 
and we're walking around. It took about three minutes through the woods from our home to get to the cemetery. And it's wooded. The way to get there is, is wooded, but a little bit of it has been cleared with a brush hog. Not cleared very well. It was very difficult to get through the terrain. The man that used to own this land that I live on, I guess it was his grandfather that owned this land. They had it completely cleared, um, I believe, for cattle and possibly some crops. But it is all, pretty much all of it has grown up now with, I guess, some invasive species. There's briars everywhere. It is such difficult terrain to traverse because the briars, these thorns are two, three inches long and they're everywhere. And so even where the brush hog has cleared, it's still slow going. It's still walking over a lot of limbs and there's just really rugged ground. And But it took us about three minutes, even through that, to get to the cemetery. And the cemetery is surrounded by a chain link fence. Um, it's still being used to this day, I believe, by a, you know, a family, a couple families. And they have a company that comes out and keeps it mowed and keeps an area near it mowed where people can park their cars. There's no parking lot. They just park in the grass. And so we're inside the chain link fence and we're walking around and it's, it's a fairly good sized cemetery. I would say, um, I'm not good with mathematical estimations, but I would say maybe four, 500 feet long and maybe almost as wide. It's kind of a big square and it's got a lot of open space. There aren't, there aren't headstones filling up the whole thing. There's a lot of open space. But in the section where the older headstones were is where I was. And I walked all around the cemetery and decided to take some pictures because I've heard that it is a possibility for orbs to be seen where Sasquatch are or where they could be. And I have a friend who has seen orbs and Sasquatch about 30 minutes from where I live. And I thought, you know, wouldn't that be really cool to see an orb? And I've heard other people say that sometimes in cemeteries they can be seen. And I've also heard that sometimes they'll show up on camera even when you can't see them with your naked eye. So I had my phone out and I was taking pictures of the headstones and around the cemetery and it was getting dark. It was maybe 7.30 or so, maybe eight. I don't remember exactly, but it was dusk at this point and I knew we needed to get back home. I didn't want to be walking through the woods at dark. And I was just about to turn my camera off and put my phone away when I, without thinking about it, I turned the flash on on my phone. I turned to my left facing the chain link fence and the woods and I took a picture. I hadn't seen anything. I hadn't heard anything. I didn't have any feelings of being watched. I wasn't nervous. I wasn't afraid. I don't know why I took that picture. It was just trees. That's all I knew, and but I did. I took it. And I put my phone away, and I look around, and I couldn't find my boyfriend. I didn't see him anywhere, and I thought, well, maybe he's bending down reading a headstone, so I'm looking more closely, looking behind headstones. I don't see him anywhere, and I got a little nervous, and so I hollered his name, and he yelled back to me from a clearing on the other side of the tree line from the cemetery. And I guess this large clearing back there piqued his interest. He didn't know what it was for. And we don't really know at this point what it was for. So he comes walking from that direction and we meet back up and 
we decided to walk the road home, which took quite a bit longer than just cutting through the woods. And it was dark by the time we got home. So about three days go by and I hadn't looked at the pictures that I had taken that night, but I did look at them after I would snap them. It would show a preview on my phone and I wasn't seeing any orbs. So I didn't really, I didn't think there was anything in the photographs that was worth looking back on. But I decided to, nevertheless, and scrolling through, and I get to that last picture that I took of the tree line on the other side of the fence from the cemetery. And I thought, I wonder if there's anything in there. And I zoom in, and I'm panning around. And all of a sudden, I see this face. And I'm like, wait a minute, what is that? And I kept looking at it and I, I kept thinking, no, there's no way that that can't be a face. But to me, I could see two eyes. I could see a brow ridge and I could see a nose. And even the nose was black. It looked textured like a dog nose. This looked like some sort of dog or wolf face to me. But again, I hadn't heard anything. And I didn't see anything with my eyes while I was there, but I'm seeing this face in the photo. And I thought, nope, nope, it's probably pareidolia. There's nothing there. I'm going to just forget about it. But you know what? In a few weeks time, I'll come back and I'll look at it. And if I can find this face again, if it's this clear to me again, then I'll ask somebody else. I'll see somebody else can see it. Maybe there's something there in a few weeks. We'll We'll find out. I'll ask. So I was sitting out on the deck connected to the shop building that I live in with my two dogs a couple weeks after visiting the cemetery. I was sitting out there. I was actually listening to Dogman Encounters on my phone. And it was a beautiful day, middle of the day. And my dogs were laying there beside me sleeping and my coffee was running low in my cup. So I was thinking about getting up and going and getting a fresh cup of coffee, but I was intrigued by the story. So I hadn't paused it yet. Hadn't got up yet. And I hear the chain link fence of the kennel, my dog's kennel rattle. And it's about seven or eight feet, maybe 10 feet away from my front door and to the left of the deck that I'm sitting on. And it's about, it's about eight feet high. I'm sitting there and I hear the chain link rattle, which isn't common. It's wound pretty tight. It doesn't rattle often that I recall hearing. So that caught my attention and I look that direction. And after I look at the fence, my dogs get up and they go to the front door and they're wanting inside. And that's not really common of them to do that. They really like being outside. And most of the time, they won't stay by me when they're outside. But that day, they were. So that might be something else of note. And they, so they went to the door and they wanted in. And I grabbed my coffee cup and I thought, well, I'll, you know, I'll pause this, I'll go in let the dogs in and get myself some coffee. And I open the screen door. And as I'm opening the door and the dogs are going in the house, I start to hear this really loud sniffing. And it startled me. And I immediately looked down at my dogs because it sounded like a dog sniffing. But neither of them were sniffing. And so I just quickly thought, okay, let them go inside, shut the door, and then see if you can still hear it. And it had either stopped or maybe the volume of it had gone down of the sniffing noise. But after I shut the door, I heard it again and it was very loud. And I'm looking through the window in at my dogs and they are standing four or five feet away from the door looking at me and neither of them are sniffing but I'm clearly hearing this very loud sniffing and it scared me. 
So I opened the door and I came inside and I shut and locked the big door. And I was like, nope, not going back out there today. It was within that same month, maybe about a month's time, my boyfriend and I were sleeping and I woke up to this loud banging noise. It was kind of, it sounded like five quick successive bangs. And it sounded like they were on the garage door, which was on one of the bedrooms across from us. And it woke me up. It was that loud. It was 4 a.m. I looked at my phone and it was 4 a.m. I woke my boyfriend up. I said, you know, what was that? And he did not hear it. Um, but he could tell by my fear that I had clearly heard something and I was worried. And we laid there and the dogs didn't bark. We didn't hear anything else and we fell back asleep. But what I've learned is that it's important to take note of these things when they happen. To validate that it could be something. Not to ignore it. And I've learned that it's important to realize that Sasquatch and Dogmen do exist. That... Sometimes they do bang on houses and it may not be to scare us. It may be just juveniles playing pranks, just something fun for them to do that they enjoy, that they think is funny. I think what matters most to me is for there to be awareness for all of us and for our future kids and our future grandkids. So that when a Sasquatch is encountered, it's not as traumatizing or hopefully not traumatizing at all, that we can validate them, that we can provide them with answers. So when they see a tall, white-haired thing walking in their front yard, someone can say, I think I know what it is you saw. It might be a Sasquatch. Here are some places that you can learn about them. Here are some things that you can do. The only other thing that I've thought about that may or may not pertain to Sasquatch at all, but nevertheless, I'll include it. I was about 10 years old and I was living north of Kansas City, Missouri. And I was sleeping one night. I had a day bed and it was pushed up against the window. Oh, there is something else as well. It was pushed up against the window. And I just remember waking up and sitting up and looking at my window. And I saw these great big red eyes and didn't make any sense to me because my window was 15 or so feet, possibly more up off the ground. But I ran and I ran into my mom's room and woke her up. And I was never given any answers for that. But I was told, you know, there was nothing there. I was fine. But I've not forgotten that. I've never known what that was. I want to include when I was living in the home in Michigan. As I've said, I like to have windows open as I do today when it's nice outside. And... During the summer seasons, nice seasons, I like to sleep by open windows because I like to feel the breeze. It soothes me. It's peaceful. So my husband at the time and I were laying there and we were sleeping. And I was suddenly awoken by the loudest, most terrifying screaming that I have ever heard in my life. It gave me instant chills. It made me completely freeze. I couldn't move. I don't know whether I, I couldn't move even if I wanted to, or <laughs> I just know I was so terrified. I didn't want to make any noise. I didn't want whatever that was out there screaming to even know that I could hear it or that I was there. I was too afraid to even move my head to look over and see if my husband was awake and listening. But the screaming 
was very, very loud. It sounded like whatever was making it had an enormous lung capacity. It probably went on for 15, 20 minutes for a long time. It felt, I don't know for certain. And I remember trying to figure out what it was. And in my head, I'd be convinced that is a woman being tortured and killed out in my garden, in my front yard, to that is almost otherworldly, to <sighs> kind of animalistic, but not like a cat that I've ever heard, not even like a, a lion. I mean, it just, it sounded like, like I said, it would go from being a woman being severely hurt to just almost like someone was trying to just terrify something. And it was terrifying me. And I laid there frozen, not able to move. And it finally quit. And I was still too scared to move. And at some point, I fell back asleep. And in the morning, as soon as I woke up and my husband woke up, I was like, what was that? Did you hear that? What was that? And he had not even heard it. It didn't even wake him up. And I described the sound to him. I described the screaming. And he said, well, maybe it was a rabbit being killed. I just really have a hard time thinking that a rabbit could sound... It, <sighs> If I think of a rabbit making that noise, it would have to be some monstrously huge, enormous, 800-pound rabbit. <laughs> so it's, I just really can't believe that that was a rabbit making that noise. And I even went on YouTube and listened to the sound of rabbits being killed, and it was nothing like that. It was much more intense, much louder much more terrifying and did not sound like an animal that I have ever heard. And those were my experiences. Well, that's it for tonight's show. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let us know. Thanks for listening. Have a great night. Seen a bunch of run down no horse towns where the church is the backbone loves in the plow. And the five string melodies groove in With the farmland rows where the roots run deep Beyond the noise of the busy streets Where the songs of the south are soothing When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah